10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Live from Derbyshire, this is The Sunday Lunch Show with Brent Poland, and you are listening live. And welcome to this morning's lunch, afternoon's lunch show, good afternoon, uh, with me, Adam Spence, and um, we're going to, with me, Brent Poland, with Adam Spence. Hello. Gosh. Yeah, hello, you there. Um, we're going to have a good chat this morning about well, something that was in the news this week, something that's very topical, and that's going to look at the private school situation, and even just this idea of, does the school you go to affect This the is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or join in the conversation by downloading the Podbean app and following Teachers Talk Radio. Hashtag TT Radio. Okay, well, welcome everyone to this um, Sunday show. I uh, hope everyone's all right um, and you're having a good week. Um, we've got a Christmas tree behind us, so we can see the seasons changing and moving. Um, I've got two weeks left, Brent. How about you? All right, thanks very much for that. <laughs> yeah, I've got two weeks and three days, or as we call it, in the third week, um, being a history teacher, that will be All Quiet in the Western Front on Netflix. That will be uh, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. No, we can't use that any longer. I'll probably dig up some documentary about Afghanistan and 9-11 for my year 10 year. Anyway, fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll call that, we'll call that <laughs> half a week DVD week and yeah. be done with it. But educational DVD week, because yeah. obviously, you know, it's got to be educational. But I remember school, you know, when I was young and kind of from the 1st of December on was almost the whole of Advent. Teachers kind of just had a bit of extra time, didn't they? they kind of, we kind of just paused for games and, you know, do you not have that? Is this the standard of education <laughs> in England? In England, Seriously, yeah. No wonder yeah, the pizza league tables are so bad. Yeah, this is what's what? happening. Yeah, the, the the TV got wheeled out of the um, ah, the the cupboard. The TV, the TV, the big giant the big... monster that was wheeled out. On, of, yeah, and yeah. then we all thought, oh, great, what are we watching today? Yes, yeah. yeah. And then, and then we kind of we kind of certainly the last week was just all about kind of uh, games and um, you know wearing clothes and having Christmas parties ah, and, and, and that fun. type of thing. But now it's now it's right down to the end, isn't it? It's right down to the last bit. I think I've got a kind of almost like assessments um, co- co- the last week. I, I'm one of those that likes pretty much, especially in exam classes, of reasonably teaching to the end. So I've always been a bit, bit grinchy that way. And even the kids are starting to go, sir, can we put some Christmas music on? Christmas starts in December when I finish school for me. Because I, I, I think it's getting a bit dragged out now to be honest with you it's getting a bit too much sometimes um, and it's great you know I, I like my nativity plays you know who doesn't like love actually when you get the little octopus in there now i've got children you know that they're they're having rather strange parts in the nativity play which i never realized was part of my nativity play because i mean i always played joseph which was the prime part and a girl called tanya mulligan used to play mary in my primary school going to a religious school we had the whole Jesus is the reason for the season. So um, our version of uh, Christmas was a little bit more Silent Night, Holy Night, with a lot more religion thrown in, which is interesting because next week we, yeah, we're, we're going to look at, um, I think, th- this idea of faith schools. That's coming up as well. And that was something that's been mentioned in, in, in the news. And that, that kind of debate about what is the position of faith-based schools and I've seen that with the census data. I love my census data. The social scientists. Yeah, it's been, been brilliant. Yeah, I've, I've liked it. I've crunched the numbers, and and I was looking at you know when we saw individuals trying to weaponize and and change some of that data, and they, they were called out, and it was really good to see them called out. But there was the interesting take that you know Christians are now a minority, and and that what is the place for faith based schools. In a country, and I actually had a conversation last night, national radio, about that. And and I'm, I'm going to say I am a little bit biased on this because I educated in a faith-based school, and I've chose to be educating in a faith-based school for the last 18 years. And and I I, I can I extol the virtues of it, but I understand that there is a debate out there that some will probably suggest that the country now is it is relevant and what is the purpose of faith-based education so that's our show for next yeah, week yeah definitely so we're, we're kind of doing this shout out early really so if anyone would like to get involved uh, next week and be involved i guess that could be our yep. christmas nativity couldn't it talk Ooh. about uh, faith-based uh, faith-based Ooh. education um and you know you know i was of cv school 
mm. uh, primary school. Yep. So me, me and my daughter having this conversation earlier on this week, really, about kind of how broad her religious education is and how narrow mine is. And again, who knows what the outcome of that is, but uh, it's certainly an interesting uh, debate. Um, but um, today we're going to focus on uh, private uh, schools versus state schools largely, about life chances and uh, cultural capital and economic capital and those types of things. So again, um, just before we kind of go into that big debate, uh, maybe in half an hour or so after the news, uh, we want to make sure that you know, everyone's had an opportunity to, to tweet in, message in, um, call in. We'd really like to hear from some people again. Um, if there's anybody out there, I'd, I'd like somebody <laughs> to have an argument with me. I yeah, love. Cool. I'm a Socratic individual. I love my arguments, my discussion, yeah. and debates. So, if for next week, if anybody wants to have a discussion, somebody who's completely against, you know, religious education, for, and, and there are, you know, strong views on this, more than happy to have that conversation. More than happy for people to yeah. ha- express their views because that's what Teacher Talk Radio is about. We're we're an eclectic bunch, aren't we, teachers made up of all different. I mean, just like Teacher Talk Radio, we're an eclectic bunch of individuals from all different spectrums even different countries but we've one core thing in common we believe in the purpose of education and the function of education and we love and enjoy uh, what we do and, and who we are is is very diverse so by all means if you if you feel like you can contribute to that then let us know and we, we, we can get you pre-arranged guests on as well but there is a there is a theme between the two weeks and the theme between the two weeks is is what is the organization structure of education function of education what is the purpose and how can and it shape your future. I mean, I have strong views in it because for me, education was the rescuing factor. It was one of those things we call a rescuing factor. And a rescuing factor is growing up with what I grew up with. Education was, was the only avenue out of, say, poverty. It was, the, it was the key to unlocking my potential future of being able to travel around the world or see, do things that were way beyond my reach considering where I grew up. And I believe in that. I, I really do genuinely believe that we have a, a, a really important role in society as educators to get children beyond where they currently are to be better than they currently can be and unlocking their potential. And what we'll, we'll, we'll talk about today is, is that rhetoric that we hear from the guys in charge seems to mirror that. But in the reality and the actuality, their policies don't always match that. There is the difference between uh, what we desire out of our education system and what it's actually delivering. And, and I suppose being in the education system for as long as I've been, there is, I'm not saying I'm getting cynical, but I'm getting to that point where, have we heard this before? I, I, oh, we've heard that before. And you are seeing some of the same policies being wheeled out. And you think, we've tried that. That hasn't worked. We heard this before. It hasn't worked. So there has to be that, I suppose, that discussion that we as educators and also parents, because a lot of us also, not only educators, we are putting our own children through the education system. And I suppose my take in it is, I find the current education system to be an absolute minefield. And I have friends of mine asking discussions about where will I send my child? I had this discussion recently with a friend, a very dear set of friends, and they're up in Yorkshire. And they have had their child do the 11 plus. And that's not something a couple of years ago I would have thought that they would have done. Their child doing the 11 plus. It's not available for my own children in this area. But then again, if I live down in Kent, would I be sending my child to a grammar school or, or in one of the areas where the postcode is different? I just find the whole education system top to bottom regionally confusing. And I find it very, very, very hard to navigate. And I, I, if I am, and I, I'm in the education system, it must be really difficult for a lot of parents out there. And it doesn't help when you hear the media and the politicians coming out with what we're going to play here about fighting over who's got the most aspiration and where to send your children can change the outcomes. So what we're able to try and do is we're able to try and have that debate, you know, what is best for our children? And does education play such a vital role in shaping the outcomes later on in life? Yeah, so please feel free to um, call in. Um, just generally, kind of this week, um, just kind of, kind of want to kind of share my thoughts on this week. I went to see the um, Neil Young Harvest film uh, with a friend, and um, again, just sat there blown away by the creative process um, of watching <laughs> one man trying to you know, make a song out of nothing really. And it's 
the conversation we had on the way back from the cinema was um, teaching is a creative space and it's um, are we given this the time and the resources sometimes to really express that creative side of ourselves um, I thought it was uh, really fascinating kind of watching that so um, it's at independent cinemas uh, the Neil Young film if you get a chance to uh, go and see it but these things are incredible I don't know if you've seen the um, Beatles get back film or any of these things that show this the, the, the long process that creativity takes and seeing it kind of on the big screen is absolutely incredible um, so I don't think they, they, they sometimes could be used for lessons maybe just to break things down sometimes we don't often um, film or see the creative process but um, do you know who he's are, married to? I don't know you don't know who Neil Young's married to? no I don't to? Kim Basinger is it? yeah I know it's one of those you like. You see them together as a couple. You think, yeah. "Wow, Kim Basinger and Neil Young." Because yeah. Neil Young's like, you know, you know, not exactly. <laughs> God, <a Hollywood, laughs> you know, I have to be very yeah. choose my words carefully yeah, yeah, here. But yeah. but yeah, yeah, they're they're a power couple. Yeah, he's, he's cool though. He's really cool. Oh, he's intelligent, and, 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 that, and that's that's the thing yeah. about him. He's he's so cool, which is so frustrating. Um, you know, I've unfortunately kind of you know. There's going to be boos and whistles, but no, I'm wrong. I, I, I'm, you're, you're no, I've got, got them mixed up. It's Daryl Hannah, not Kim Basinger. Daryl Hannah, who's Splash? Splash, yeah, yeah, Daryl yeah. Hannah, yeah, yeah, in the eighties okay. and nineties. Yeah, how could I get them confused? I don't know. They're very alike. Yeah, forgive me for that, listeners. I'm sorry <laughs> I've confused Neil uh, Neil Young's current wife of Daryl Hannah and Kim yeah. Basinger, but there we go, Daryl Hannah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I went for, I was in. I, I'd, I'd gone for that and, and kind of believed you, but um, yeah, if you, if you kind of. I mean, it'd be interesting, you know, a, a proper behind-the-scenes thing on teaching, wouldn't it? Just to just to go through the hours that goes into uh, creating something um, is often sometimes just not rewarded. I don't know how many times your SLT have said we've got a meeting coming up or a presentation coming up, and you've got you know a couple of hours to prepare or whatever. Is that uh, uh, is that you, long enough to? <laughs> are you suggesting that I? kind of like would react to that or listen to that or no, well, do you think my SLT asked me to do things like that knowing <laughs> that the response is usually going to be 50 questions of why am I doing that why am I doing that these are the words that usually come out of my why am I doing that why am I doing that this is why I'll never be a head teacher you see people yeah. like me never get to be a head no. teacher because I'm that guy in the meeting that goes why are we doing this what's the purpose of it what's the function of it and it is annoying but at the same time, I, I feel a bit like the children sometimes, and that's one of the important things that we have to say, is why do we do things? What is the purpose behind yeah. it? What's the function behind it? Why am I teaching this? And I'm always constantly asking, why am I, why am I doing this? This is insanity. This doesn't work. So, yeah, I often find myself having those conversations. And, and, and again, put back to this, why is the current education system set up the way it is? Why is it organised when the outcome has been year after year a widening of the social mobility gap. We have a social mobility czar, and I actually don't mind some of the techniques that are employed by in the school that, that, that seems to be a model for that, that idea. Problem is, I often have that niggle of, would that work across the whole country? Is that just a sticking plaster over a gaping wound? We need a root and branch, I believe, overhaul of the whole philosophy of education for what is its actual for purpose and function? Is it to produce workers for the future, industrial school, which we talked about last week, or is it produce well-rounded, critical thinking, socially mobile, um, I suppose, confident young people who are capable of navigating a very fast-paced world? Because at the moment, our, our children are being wrote, learned, a knowledge-based curriculum, and having to write essays in exam-style questions that has absolutely no benefit to them whatsoever when they get to future life. And that was if you want to listen back to it, the, the crux of our podcast mm. uh, and our, our broadcast last week is what, why are we doing what we're doing? So what we want to have a chat about is, is why is the education set up the way it is? It's just inherited like everything else, it yeah. seems, in the country at the moment. We've inherited systems that are archaic, Victorian almost. An education system like our water, like most infrastructure, I think is just layer upon layer that's just been added to. And, and bolted on, and every sort of new political party that gets into the power adds another layer on or takes a layer back, and we just keep going around in circles. When the honest the answer is the people in education are going, why am I forced to do this? What's the purpose and the function behind it? And I often think of children when they go into school at four years old to the time they leave school at 18. 
their, their education has just been one big giant moving conveyor belt of, of kind of spiel where things keep constantly changing. Nothing ever settles down, does it, or get an opportunity to be embedded. But why why do some children, and this is the social scientist in me, why do some children do well and other children do not? It, it's something that keeps me thinking about what I'm doing because how can I help these children if the system is set against me or not helping me? So maybe I have to find ways to somehow ignore what I'm being directed to do if I think what I'm being directed to do is not going to achieve the outcome, which I believe the outcome should be to grow without nurture and, and, and that's what I want for my children. I want my children to be educated. I don't want them to just pass exams. I want them to be a well-rounded individual, freely thinking, creative, confident, able to handle this world that is so, so fast-paced. And I think we're just playing catch-up now. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely, I mean, yeah, having kind of those clear objectives, um, yeah, we can, you can see that from those kind of creative people. And I think that's sometimes just what we want, really, is we want just like a clear pathway of, of, of what the outcome is. Anyway, are you ready for my Christmas cracker joke for today? Oh, no, God, no. Oh, go on. Do I need to yeah, see if there's a, oh, God, I could probably find a drum roll, but I don't know how to do it. I'll, I'll, I'll do a little, a little effect in a minute. Right, so, why are educated people hotter? I don't know why they're hotter. Because they've got more degrees. Right. Okay. What are you here? So it's, well, it's, 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 are educated, are educated, do educated people have degrees? There's another one. Ah, right. So ah. Yeah, so it leads us on. It does, doesn't it? Do you have to be educated? Do you have to be educated to have a degree? I had a conversation with one of my colleagues who has uh, their sister, who is a highly driven, motivated, and successful individual. Mm. Says, are they thinking about leaving their job? And the first response was, they can't leave their job because they won't get another job because they don't have a degree. And that is somebody who I would have thought would have been well qualified. She says, no, well, she's got life experience and experience and does the job. But as she was telling me, that there seems to be barriers, almost snobbish barriers to stopping that individual. And that comes back to it, doesn't it? That that almost made me think of this, because unless you have a degree of a certain quality from a certain university, then your life chances are less. Unless you have a certain accent, your life chances are less. If you don't have the cultural capital, your life chances are less. If you've not been to a Russell Group University, your life chances are less. You've not Oxford, and and you, you go down to it. And I feel like we're still in a medieval feudal system. Mm. I still think we've got some trace elements of a medieval feudal system. Or, and it, it seems that education is meant to be that leveller, but actually, I still think we're almost regressing back to some medieval feudal system. Yeah, I think you're definitely right. But um, does this happen every time you open a Christmas cracker joke at home? <laughs> you better have a debate about. So you poor kids are sat on the other side of the table, just just listening to them. They 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 just switch off. <laughs> they switch off. I think the whole family switch off. Everybody switches off me sometimes yeah, yeah. when I go off on one. You know, yeah. part it's part of my superpower. One of the things that, about me that people just tune in or tune out. You know? <laughs> so there's um, it's interesting that, that those things bring even a little thing like that brings up that debate over kind of what is it to be educated, um, and then kind of how how do we start to measure success out of this system? Well, it's like intelligence. Yeah. I mean, I have a certain level of intelligence one way, mm. but you put numbers and letters together in algebra, yeah. and my brain just goes, why are the numbers and letters being mixed together? <laughs> but numbers over there, letters over yeah. there, and it's just, and it's it's interesting when you're a teacher yourself and you have to learn new things. Mm. It's, it's always a very good thing that teachers always have to relearn because it puts us in the position of the children. And I like that feeling sometimes when yeah, you have to, course, you, yeah. because then you have to figure out that there's things that come so instinctually natural to me. And the same as some children I'm looking at my class, there's some things that come instinctually natural to them. But there's other things that don't. And some of the most talented children I've taught, and I call them the Leonardo da Vinci's, mm. because by modern standards, they are neurodivergent, mm. or they are special educational needs. And I hate that word. I even hate the idea of that. Because I just don't like to feel as if there are, well, you know, you're you're not as good. Or I don't like this concept of second class, third class, are not as good. And it, it comes into my very DNA and core. And I don't like to f- make students think that they're not capable of being a rocket scientist. And I, it is literally the one philosophy. If somebody said to me, what's my philosophy of education or my driving force? It's literally the day I read Carol Dweck. The day I read Carol Dweck, 
was the day I sort of realised that's exactly what I, I would like. Everybody has the potential to be the best that they can. Inside every child is a genius. We just got to find what their genius at. The Lewis Hamiltons of this world, if he never got into a go-kart because his dad was a, into go-karts, the world would never have had a world champion. Rory McIlroy would never have been a golfer unless his dad had taken him at three years old. Mozart, only as Mozart because his parents had a piano. And it comes down to that. It comes mm. down to creating those life chances and opportunities it's for children. Isn't it? yeah. And if you'd ever give them those opportunities, I played rugby at 25. If I hadn't been playing rugby at 15, I could have went further with it. But I played rugby at 25 because I never got the opportunity at school ex except to play Irish sports. Mm. And you had to be good at them. And you sort of think, that's the same with our children. That's why we've got to find ways to not say to a child, oh, okay, you don't get to level this and this subject. That doesn't mean you're not clever or intelligent or you're not going to be educationally successful. Yeah. It means that you just don't tick that box. Yeah. I don't tick some boxes. And in some ways, my wife's a PhD, double PhD doctorate. Absolute brain. But who watched what University Challenge? Who gets University Challenge correct? <laughs> Me. Who could do an Excel spreadsheet with bells and whistles on it? She can. It doesn't mean that I'm not intelligent or yeah. she's not intelligent. It's just it goes back to that different types of intelligence. And I don't like the way our education system seems to somehow beat some children and delimit their outcomes based upon what well, their accident of birth. This is what it is, isn't it? The, yeah. the sheer geographical location of some children, and and then the look that they have parents who have got the social mobility driven into them themselves. It's just, a, it's a lottery. Yeah. We also want to have a fair debate today as well, don't we? So if, if anybody has had a, a good experience of private education and wants to sing the virtues of private education, I mean, we are, we, we have to kind of just say we are not no. privately educated. <laughs> so we haven't had that uh, input. I, I have family members who have chosen uh, private education. Um, interestingly, they chose private education for the first up to GCSE hmm. and then moved to state schools for, for sixth form. Um, I don't know if that's a financial decision. or. Apparently that happens a lot, that people yeah. mix and match, yeah. or sometimes they send one child who thinks that they would cope better. Yeah. Um, and, and again, my own parents did that. I, I failed the 11 plus, went to secondary school with my older brother. My younger brother passed the 11 plus, went to the grammar school. The irony was, is that the two that went to the secondary school did better than the two who went to the grammar school. Yeah. However, I went to the grammar school at my GCSEs to A-level. Yeah. And it was the best thing ever happened to me. So I often find myself conflicted about 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 grammar schools because I wouldn't have got to university if I hadn't been for my politics teacher, who was inspiration. And the man's an absolute legend. He should have been teaching university, but he probably took the rough diamond that I was and turned me into a bit of a more civilized savage that I am now. <laughs> but that's the thing, you, you know, the pathways are there, and some benefit from some, and some benefit from the other. So yes, a, a fair and balanced debate we will try and have. Yeah. Um, because seven percent of the country goes to a private school, so that's six hundred and fifty odd thousand people, and some people have had absolutely fantastic you mm. know opportunities and had best education provided. But equally, you get you get this sometimes said, and this grinds my gears, is when you get oh well, there's better teachers in the private sector, oh gosh the better facilities, oh more aspirational, and we'll play the clip from the prime minister, which I take exception to, as if you know attacking my parents because they want the best for me. Every parent I've taught in the last two and a half thousand children I've taught, the vast majority of those parents want the best for their children. It's just that what the best for their children is out of their reach, not because of their child's ability, because of their ability to pay. And I don't think in a meritocracy, this is the, this is the core for me, this country is meant to be a meritocracy. It's meant to be built upon the idea you work hard and you strive and you do your best. It's what made Britain's Great Britain, wasn't it? Mm. The risk taking, the meritocracy, the, the opportunities, the innovation. Yeah. Yeah. People, people came from nowhere. The guys that invented steam engines were, weren't even engineers. You know, mm. people have been winging it for generations in this country, and yet the social mobility seems to be getting less and less. Ironic that when you think about what built the country's greatness was the ability for ordinary people to take chances and risks and somehow end up, you know, being a great inventor. And we have seen that decline, and, and and there's a, I have to say, the ladder pulling really upsets me that those, this idea of you know there is a a school system that is good and better, and there is a school system that's inferior, and that mm. that ticks my box, and that really gets me going because that makes me think, and I said it last night on the radio, am I a second class teacher teaching in a second class education system? Is there a first class and a second class when it comes to education? Is that really what it boils down to? And if you can afford 
first class, well, why don't you sit in first class, but your second class and even a third class as well. Is that really where we're at, where we're having a you know, streamed education system? Because let's be honest about it. If we, if that is our system. We have to be honest about it. Stop skirting around the issue. Spade's a spade. Do we have an education set up for a group of people who are more privileged than others? And trying to change that is not, it's not going to work. We can't change that. Can we change it? Here's the other aspect. Can Is it worth changing? How can we change it? How can the education system become more egalitarian, more fair? And who is going to do that? And is it right that they should do that? Because, you know, is the, if this is what the country wants, if people can keep consistently voting political parties in that keep the education system as it is. Therefore, by conclusion, you deem that the country's happy with their education system. Well, there's certainly no... I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll play the... After, after the news, we'll, we'll, we'll go deep on this and we'll play the um, Keir Starmer, uh, Rishi Sunak debates um, earlier on in the week. But um, I, th- I think the general consensus is... And you, um, it was said on the rate on LBC last night, which you were on, which is fantastic. Um, that if Labour do get in, if that's the if that's the likely trajectory, will there be that much change? Was there that much change? I mean, well, look, no, I, will it will it be? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, it would be interesting. We'll have this debate with it within that section, but I can't I can't see. Well, there certainly hasn't been anything announced, has there? That, 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 no. would, that would that would change. Nothing about the major issues in education. Yeah. They seem to be picking battlegrounds like this, private schools, public schools. And whether, I think the consensus was, with the one-hour radio slot that the National Radio last night, which I chipped into that debate, was that it was window dressing, that this was scoring cheap political points rather than actually the root and branch cause it, causal problems. of. But, but here's the thing. You cannot fix the education system without fixing society mm. and vice versa. Yeah. Any levelling up or any concept of levelling up has to be connected to education because it is in, it is unbelievably empowering and what education can do. And when I look at some countries that are starting to progress up the league tables, not just in education, but in standard of living and quality of life, you cannot separate the whole thing. Your social policy, housing, your employment, your benefits, your all of this has to be connected to education. You ca- it cannot sit in isolation because... It, your school is part of the community and you could plant the most highly, you know, the new facility school. You see this a lot. I think Labour tried to do this, didn't they? They were, they, they, you know, they put a lot of money into education and in some schools they uplifted those schools and they got brilliant facilities and fantastic, plenty of money thrown at them. But that didn't work for some schools because you didn't look at the cultural capital. You didn't look at the, 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 the areas, but you didn't look at employment. You didn't look at attitudes. And for me, it's the soft skills, it's confidence, it's attitude, it's perception, it's values. It's it's also the comp- it's this aspect of people believing they can actually change. It's this idea of through education I can strive. And it's interesting watching the different groups of people who embrace the education system and take advantage of it of which the Prime Minister would say that his parents were exactly that. Yeah. So there is the aspect there that you, there is there is pathways there if you are determined enough and you fight enough. I'm, I am not going to deny that that was the rescuing factor for me was my parents' attitude of, you know, you will go to university. There was no negotiation. I was going to university. Same as my cousins, same as my brothers, because they were so determined to override where I was coming from. But the problem is, is that attitude came from them but in a community that was, say, for instance, different to my community, didn't have that fight, didn't have that um, that desire to change the system. I think a lot of people are just cyclically driven down to the point where, well, what's the point? There's nothing they're going to change. And I noticed the cynicism even from the children. And, he, and, and one of the things that really is despairing is you're trying your best to motivate people. And you know that as soon as they walk out of your classroom, they go back into the community. Yeah. All your hard work, can be so and I've seen so many children I thought I'd made a difference to and I thought I've, I've really got through to them and you put them out into society and then you see a couple of years later on social media what's happened to them and you think we you know they were given opportunities in education so it, can, it cannot just be education you cannot do this just with education it's got to be more and I think that's what where, where it's got to be connected we've got to do our bit but it's got to be the wider conversation in society about social mobility as well and life chances Right, brilliant. So we're going to head to the uh, news um, and then we're going to come back and have a real deep dive on this, have a look at what's been going on 
over social media. There's been loads on the news this week. I mean, it's, it's actually blown up, hasn't it? As soon, as soon as it kind of, as soon as it started talking, um, if that was um, Labour's point this week to kind of make it front and centre, they, they achieved that, and that's why we're talking about it uh, this afternoon. So we'll be back after the news. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading! This episode of Teachers Talk Radio has been made possible with support from Witherslack Group, the UK's leading provider of SEN education and care. They're here to support you too through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.witherslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. ITV News reports on the workload of educational psychologists in Gateshead, who say they are overwhelmed as the number of children needing special educational help has risen by 117% in eight years. This has placed a strain on SEND services in the area, but the load has been especially large for EPs. Deborah Mason, service manager for SEND in Gateshead, said that there had been a wait for some people to complete their doctorate, although assistant ed psychs have been used to enhance the team. This report comes shortly after the Secretary of State for Education in England, Gillian Keegan, sent a message to the education and care sector about SEND reform. In the message, Ms Keegan said she believed that pupils and students should always be able to get a high quality education and receive the right support. She acknowledged the challenges of a complex system, but said that her department wanted to take time to listen to children and parents, as well as those in the system, before publishing a response to the SEND and Alternative Provision Green Paper. An improvement plan would be published in the new year, she added. Part of the plan would include investing £21 million into training 400 more educational psychologists. For young people in areas like Gateshead, this funding can't come soon enough. The BBC News website reports on claims that the University of Derby has suspended a student for taking her baby into lectures. The female student is halfway through a degree and a tutor had agreed to her taking her son to lectures as a short term measure but this was later overruled. As the student was breastfeeding, she felt she had no option to continue, but was suspended two weeks ago. The student believes she has been discriminated against because she has a baby, but stated she had never allowed her son to disrupt the learning of others. A university spokesman said areas were available on campus for those who needed to breastfeed, but that taking a baby or child into lectures was not allowed for health and safety reasons. Meanwhile, Ulster University has defended itself against claims that it plans to open a campus in Qatar and that will have a negative impact on LGBTQ rights. The university is due to open the campus in Doha in January next year. Speaking on BBC Radio Ulster, Hannah McCulloch, chair of the LGBT Society on the university's Colrain campus, said she is worried that the university is putting financial gain over a community within their community and that it will damage the establishment's reputation. A spokesman for the university said, Ulster University believes that education is a route for societal growth, and that many UK universities had partnerships with countries across the Middle East. In Wales, the government has announced free Welsh lessons will be extended to the entire education workforce, including non-teaching staff. Alongside this, a new framework for Welsh in English medium schools has been published underlining how the Welsh language is integral to the new curriculum for Wales. 
A sabbatical course is also available for teachers to learn or improve their Welsh. Minister for Education and Welsh Language Jeremy Miles said, We want everyone to enjoy using the Welsh language. We are ambitious for our language and I am pleased to be able to extend the offer of free Welsh lessons to all school staff. Finally, in a week that saw the release of Department for Education statistics, which show a 20% drop in those entering the teaching profession, many media outlets comment on the possible impact on young people. The number of entrants to initial teacher training fell from 36,159 to 28,999 between 2021 and 22 and the 2022 to 23 training years. The government attributed the fall to the reduced number of new entrants and an increase in the target. But critics pointed out that the government's recruitment targets for secondary school teacher training has been missed in nine out of the last 10 years. A DfE spokesperson said, For teacher trainees in 2023, bursaries and scholarships in key subjects will be available. And we remain committed to raising the starting salary to £30,000. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, did you get a bargain on Black Friday? This week I'm going to talk about deals. First, a little bit of history. Tom will be proud of me. Reading up on Wikipedia and seriously condensing what I found, the term Black Friday refers to the Friday after Thanksgiving when the Christmas shopping season starts. Supposedly, it started in the 1950s. Recently, it marked a time of serious bargains, riots and fighting for unbelievable deals. However, are you getting a bargain or are you just led to believe it? Seeing as last Friday was Black Friday, which began last Monday, and next week will still be Black Friday, or for some stores Cyber Monday or Cyber Week, when you get the best deals online, how do you know a price drop? is actually a deal? Well, the short answer is you don't. I have a couple of pointers here that may help you, but the underlying advice is buyer beware. If I go with the best known online retailer, when using Amazon, there's a nifty little price tracking website called Camel Camel Camel. This will show you the price data for a product over the time it's been advertised. You can see when it was more expensive and less expensive. If you're on your phone, where most shopping takes place, hit the share icon found next to the product image, go to Camel 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 and paste it into the search box. You can even sign up to email alerts for price drops and add target discount alerts if you're not in a desperate hurry for an item. The next trick is to simply do a web search for the product. You may find it cheaper in a large supermarket store and although you may need to go and collect it to save on postage, it may be worth the journey. There's also hundreds of coupon and price comparison sites where you may be able to find further discounts. The only caveat being the time you spend researching may actually outweigh the saving you make. I return to my initial warning. Buyer beware. I hope you get a deal leading up to the holiday season. As always, I'd love to hear your favourite shopping online tips. Let us know at TTR 2022. I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. So that's quite interesting then, the, um, that story which, I, which uh, I've, I've been involved in, funny enough, because that's just up the road at the, the university. Um, literally just up the road from us. Literally up the road. Where, where yeah, we, at the we, end of the road. For you, literally, not far from where we're currently broadcasting, <laughs> yeah, right. literally. And so if, if there's a spokesperson for Derby University that wants to come down, please well, absolutely. feel free to knock on the door. And, and speak to two of your old alumni who actually <laughs> yeah. did their master's degrees yeah, there in right, education. Yeah. Where, yeah. It's where we actually met. So yeah, come, yeah, come on down, Derby Uni. We'll, yeah. have, we'll, have, we'll have a chat. And, and, and that was the thing. So talking about outcomes, we both did our master's degree there as part of an outreach programme to our local schools. Mm. And our schools were neighbouring schools once a faith-based school um, which kids bust in for about 15 miles and your old school was a completely community college based yeah, yeah. school and both used to do extremely well for their different catchments and in their own niches and both of us mid-career teachers decided well, we'd do our, our, uh, our degree there and I, I can say that it was a fantastic experience our lecturers were brilliant so to say I'm a bit disappointed that that's the situation that uh, somebody who is uh, mid I think mid twenties they are. Yeah. They have a young young child. Well, adult learner, should we say? An, an adult learner. Going back, having yeah. the courage to go back into education, just like we yeah, were. Yeah, you know, I mean, right. lifelong learning is a massive thing, massive thing in society. But there's another part of that story which is interesting, which is that they want to go in to help other young mothers. They want to go into psychology and mental health, which was another one of our actual stories, which is about 
we have a shortage of people who are doing mental health. And we have an absolute chronic crisis in mental health with children, adults, teachers as well. And there is somebody who's trying their best to get educated better themselves and they're being stopped. What's interesting is following the thread of the conversations is that some of the students who share the university lecture hall with the said student uh, who's had the child in the lecture hall, um, they haven't been any problems. There's been no complaints come from any of the students. In fact, quite a few of them defend it and says as soon as the child has you know, done what the child does, sometimes every once in a while cries out, the, the student has taken them out of the, out, out of the hall and, and they themselves have absolutely no issue with this whatsoever. So it's, I think it's been picked up by uh, the shadow, one of the shadow ministers for... Um, for apprentices, apprenticeships and training, who happens to be the MP for this for this student, and I hope they 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 get the result, which is is that we should be encouraging people, regardless of their circumstances, to better themselves, to get to university at whatever age, but also that people should be, and I say the word again, discriminated against because their circumstances does not allow them or help them through education, and, and that's the problem. It just perfectly encapsulates what we're trying to say about there is somebody who wants to be educated is trying the best to be educated to be beneficial to the rest of us in society as an educated clinical person who wants to be working in adult mental health which is what we need and there is a barrier being put in place to stop yeah it's, so it's, it's, it's incredible corn dog yeah. you know, you've got this you yeah can, you, you can do better than you this. can so um, i mean um, i mean i don't know how this has kind of happened whether it's things have got kind of crossed wires or whatever but uh you know, you know, it's, it's a it's a great university, and it kind of brings people in from the community. It's in the heart of the city, and you know, uh, I feel very passionate about the fact that you know, they that they can, they can do better than this. So, yeah. um, you know, and allow people. I mean, to come into it. I mean, certainly, as you, I mean, the, the, the barriers. We know there's there's barriers for education for women. There's barriers for education for parents, particularly. Uh, I don't know the story. Is it a single mother or is it just a... I'm not too sure, but no. I know that they... It, it's, it's, a, it's because they're currently breastfeeding yeah. and therefore, um, which is a choice. Um, it's a good, a healthy choice because yeah. breastfeeding is better for um, for the child. Um, and we know that. There's, there's such a movement now mm. of encourage. And again, I, I know all this because I've got a young family, but my wife was a champion of breastfeeding mm. because she knows as a clinical psychologist the benefits of it and, yeah. and this is the thing we're encouraging people to to choose what best for their child and here we have somebody who's trying to do the best thing for their own child while also trying to facilitate becoming a person who wants to contribute to our society yeah. and they're being stopped so for me that perfectly encapsulates how we should be doing everything we can to encourage them to not only be able to do what's best for their own child but to get them into a place where they're able to use their skills and yeah, talents definitely. to help solve, help others, yeah. because that's that's the purpose of education. We want her to have the skills and talents to be able to not only be a good mother, which she's trying to be to her own child, but at the same time actually be of use to us as, as a society and in a position which we really need. You talk about skill shortage. There is yeah. a there's a, there's a shortage thing. So. Yeah. I think that's a perfect news story. For yeah, I mean, there's, 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 and also there's another couple of things that are kind of in there as well about you know 117 um, percent, uh, you know, this this overwhelming uh, crush on the mental health of the people working in our CND departments. Yeah, um, and um, you know that that's kind of combined with, and we'll talk about it kind of when we go through um, the private schools and the the, the funding gaps. Um, but you know, schools are stretched. They are massively stretched. And, stretched. And uh, with the fourth yeah. emergency services, they keep saying to us, and, and CAMs have been cut, and, and and children's mental health has been cut. Um, educational psychologist used to be somebody I used to be on first name terms with. Used to come in, and used to know who the educational psychologist was and build a relationship. That I've not seen one in, in in a long time. So we we need to put support networks back in place. So that we're able to help the students, but also not just the students take the pressure off the, the, the staff, the moment, the teachers, because we are under pressure to try and cope with the, the especially after COVID, for our unprecedented situation, and also the cost of living crisis is going to create more social outcomes, which are going to need us to help again. So it's it's a perfect storm, and you add all. So there's that. And then uh, the it is interesting. Uh, and anecdotally speaking, I have recently stepped up to becoming a GCSE physics teacher. Now I'm a geography qualified teacher who's currently head of history, who's teaching key stage three English, who's been asked to do key stage four physics because I've got a little bit of a obviously ge geographical scientific background, which means I'm talking about using your right brain and your left yeah. brain. I mean, that's 
great. But, but so, so the, the reality of that is we've got a non-specialist. Yep. With respect. Thank you. <laughs> it, at GCSE. Yeah. Which is far from ideal, is it? I mean, no. I mean, although obviously you will do your best and you'll do your prep and you'll do your lessons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the reality is, is to facilitate science in your school. Yeah. They have not got anybody that's a specialist in that, nope. or they can't recruit somebody. We have lost too many people actually, yeah. and it's getting more recruit recruiting back in. And but even at that, my my supposed current specialism is history. When I'm actually qualified as a geographer, but I, I'm either or. I've always been fifty fifty. Mm -hmm. Hearts being a, a story and heads a geographer. But it's this it's this thing of filling the gaps. And I wonder how many other of my colleagues out there in other schools who are, yes, people like me that take one for the team, you know, collegiate type individuals who would say, all right, for the greater good, I'll do this. Um, I take it as a compliment that I am, but physics is the greatest, greatest shortage yeah, when greatest it comes shortage. to recruitment. That's the least amount that they've stepped up. Then design technology, computing, MFL, business studies, music, geography, or well, 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 all sciences is... is all sciences is, is, is under-recruited yeah, yeah. at the moment. English is under-recruited. Yeah. And, and the only subjects they seem to have got their numbers is history, drama, PE... And um, the classics, darling. Classics. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So and that, that, that that might lead us on to our private school. Oh, <laughs> call me darling, um, <laughs> honey. Uh, but that's that's the thing, you know. We we it, it just there it shows that there's a recruitment crisis, and I, I'm a, I'm a walking example of that recruitment crisis and the impact that's having on the fact that I'm having to take on a different subject, and, it might, and, and I don't mind doing it, but it is extra planning, it is extra responsibility. And I was nervous. Don't get me wrong. My first, my first couple of physics lessons, I was nervous because I haven't studied physics in thirty-one years. Um, thankfully, gravity is still gravity. <laughs> Electrical resistance is still equal and constant. And, and I've had to kind of go back to school myself. And I, I enjoy. I, I like learning and I like doing new things. So I, I, I would say it's an opportunity to embrace and stick something on the CV and even have a bit of a joke about it. Yeah. But I will also say that English is more of a problem for me because. I would say that my spellings are the greatest asset in my life. And I would say that I have um, rather loose command of what a comma, semicolon, <laughs> paragraph is. A, non and, a nonchalant. <laughs> yeah, a nonchalant I'd say that my training in the art of, of, of English wasn't classical at my secondary school. And as I say, when I went to my my um, grammar school, the first thing that my uh, my politics teacher looked at me, and I wrote like a four-page essay, there was no paragraph, there was no possibilities, and there was hardly a full stop. And he just basically, you know, he said, it's the work of genius, but also the work of madness. Yeah. Because I just hadn't been classically trained. And, and it's interesting seeing my own children being taught to the standard they are. Some things in education have got better. Absolutely. Yeah. Some standards have increased. But here's the irony about it. I was broadly educated, and I would prefer the broad education with less pressure and stress that I got than somebody turning around and saying to me that my seven-year-old is able to pass through SATs or cats or whatever they're doing at seven years old. And that's what worries me. That's what really worries me. This generation of children who just are educated for an exam, taught to an exam to meet a criteria or a league table. Because my education was at primary school, was up in a forest, three miles in the woods of the Moran Mountains, learning what a glaciated lock was at about age of six years old, learning about myths and legends of Finn McCool and the Fianna at six and seven years old, learning my prayers at six and seven years old. There was no negotiation on that yeah, one. Amen. But that was the thing, you know, tie-dyeing, art trips, nature walks on a Friday. When I look at it now, I practically probably had a private education, but it wasn't a private education because of the breadth and depth of that education. And that was pre-national national curriculum. That's what it was. It was yeah. literally pre-national curriculum when I was educated. And my parents specifically sent me to that school three miles away on a bus because they wanted me to be broadly educated. And guess what? That led to me failing my 11 plus. But guess what that also <laughs> meant? It also meant I learned how to learn yeah. and appreciate learning, which track it all the way through has me saying, okay, I'm not going to teach physics because I haven't done it in 30 odd years to a point where no, actually I'll have a go at it. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's about what was learned. I had a, I have a go at things because I had a go at things when I was taught about yeah. how I have a go at things when I was a kid because I was given the confidence about learning. And I think it goes back to the early years I was given that confidence. Yeah, confidence, I think, yeah. is, 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 the, is the key. And yeah. maybe that's one of the things that private school that you, that you do pay for. Um, right, should we, should we listen to Sakir? Should we listen uh, to uh, Sir uh, here? Sir Keir, and we'll find out kind of why this debate kind of kicked off uh, earlier this week.
He attacks me about where I went to school. He is attacking the hard-working aspiration of millions of people in this country. He's attacking people like my parents, Mr. Speaker. This is a country that believes in opportunity, not resentment. He doesn't understand that, and that's why he's not fit to lead. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if he thinks the route to better education in this country is tax breaks for private schools in the hope they might hand that sum that down to state school, that's laughable. Trickle down education is nonsense. And Mr Speaker, it's not just the levelling up secretary. His education minister sitting there asks, how much better would it be if Conservatives got rid of these handouts? Yeah, yeah. He talks about his record. It's simple. He can carry on being pushed around by the lobbyists, giving away £1.7 billion to private schools every year, or we can put that money to good use. End the Tory scandal. He talks about his record. Hundreds of thousands of children leaving school without the qualifications that they need. I've made my choice. What's his? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we're improving school standards for every pupil in this country. It's our reforms that are leading to us marching up the PISA league tables for reading, for writing, more good and outstanding schools, more investment in every single school. But he talks about choice. This is about supporting aspiration, Mr Speaker, and that's what this government is proud to do. OK, so the Tories have this... Um, they've had it for a while, haven't they? This aspirational comment. Mm. Um, and we've got a clip coming up that takes us back to... 2016, 2016. I think that was uh, maybe six Prime Ministers ago. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Twelve Education <laughs> Ministers. Yeah, well, God knows how many of them we've had. Um, but yeah, so that they've had this thing about um, that education is part of this uh, push towards a meritocratic society and they've I think they've said it consistently um, maybe since John Major I, I mean even pretty Margaret Thatcher maybe had it well, Margaret a, Thatcher was an education minister herself yeah. and, and of course you know she was somebody who put a lot of stock in the whole meritocracy thing considering mm. she always dwelled upon her own background a quite humble background and John Major was also a humble background as well yeah. um, so they, they often talked about that and, and her, her idea was you know that social mobility of anybody can do it uh, that's free up society very libertarian yeah. um, and you, you know she, she's an interesting one because education's always been in some countries you know above politics but we have an education system that is sometimes a hot political football and then sometimes it's forgotten about uh, and I think during the likes of Covid we saw a lot of rhetoric a lot of talk about education a lot of window dressing mm. but the actual reality on the ground was I don't think we got any assistance whatsoever and all of a sudden they realize it, it's 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 a priority I was looking at something from the NEU and it was a YouGov poll and the YouGov poll about going on strike so about teachers going on strike they have the most support of any of the professions that are talking about going out on strike and that's 60 percent currently are feeling that we are justified in going on strike mm -hmm to 30% saying we shouldn't be allowed as a public sector to go on strike. So two thirds, just, over, just, just under two thirds of the general public are with teachers for us saying enough is enough. Yeah. Because there's just been a lot of talk, generational talk for the last 20 odd years. And I think it reignited definitely under the Tony Blair years, the education, education, education. And then his, his aspiration, his idea of I'm the guy who wants your children to go to university. My gut instinct is a lot of these policies, unfortunately, politically driven, are driven by the middle. They're driven by that desire to almost demographically capture the middle class vote, which gets you cynically into power. And unfortunately, the statistics, when, it, when you look at social mobility, are damning, because everything they've done in education has not closed any gaps, if anything, during COVID, what we saw was the rogue algorithm showing the gap is widening. So for me, if that tit for tat for the two of them trying to, it, it, it's Punch and Judy show, trying to grab a certain demographic who has a value on education. And, and that's brilliant and fantastic. But what about capturing those individuals 
who should be valuing education, but maybe have been lost? And are they writing off a whole host of children there? And that, I can't help but think that both sides on that debate are fighting over the breadcrumbs off the table when there is more on the table that they should be fighting over. And, 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 and for me, it's the critical mass of the whole education system, not just appealing to a certain demographic of yeah. votes because some focus group or some lobby group on one side is pushing them or some focus group or some lobby group on the other side is pushing them. And I can't help but think that that is just window dressing to play to a gantry and it, rather than actual systematic change which is needed. Yeah. I mean, the actual proof of the pudding, I mean, Lewis Goodall's been doing some great work on this during the week. Uh, as soon as that was announced, kind of the, you know, the, the, the really good journalists have kind of started to pick the data apart and the, the graph that he shared was you know, we, we said straight away we've got to talk about this today is that um, back in 2010 2009, 2010 the gap between uh, state funded schools per student and uh, privately um, funded schools was £3,100 um, £3, uh, which is already you know, a big gap uh, but if you look where we are now, that gap is six and a half thousand pound. Um, so, you know, in terms of per student, if you think about the things that we've talked about, and we'll go on to talk about kind of reading ages and literacies and COVID gaps and, you know, recruitment issues and SEND support that we've just heard on the news now. Imagine if that six, imagine if even half of that. We were back to three thousand rather than six thousand. Uh, obviously, the private schools have, you know, to, to keep their uh, attainment going, they've had to raise their, you know, they've had to ask for, get more money in, um, so that they've recognised that if they if they're going to continue to improve, they they need that support as well. So surely, state education needs the same. And that in turn shows you that that gap is only going to widen. That's right. Yeah. Because and. and don't get me wrong. I, I do think not. It's not just about the money. It, it's it's money, but the money helps. Of course, yeah, of course, the money helps, yeah. especially when society is being asking schools to do more. Yeah. So we have a we have a double whammy. We we have more is required of schools, and yet the resources available is less. We have again staff shortages. More is required of the staff that is left, which increases your burnout rate, which in turn then increases your your agency fees because you've got too many staff off with mental health problems, but you don't have a, I mean, the whole thing is just not working in the right direction. I mean, to use it, an economics phrase, it's a, it's a negative multiplier effect. Mm. Whereas we want a positive multiplier effect. We need, we need money to go into the correct place for the correct priorities in education. And that goes back to what these guys are talking about. This is what they're picking a fight in Parliament on. I'm furious at the power of them because this is what they're picking a fight on. They're not picking a fight on recruitment or our mental health or our chronic shortage of funding. No, they're picking a fight on this. While the elephant in the room is, is the education sector is going to be walking out. Even this week, we had six forms walking out. We've had Scotland walking out, like teachers in Scotland walking out. We've got ballots for all the education unions who are basically at the end of their tether. And this is what they choose to discuss in Parliament. How disconnected are they from the reality and I just feel that that's a low hanging, low hanging fruit. It is a problem, and I think the private, I think the private versus the state education is a problem. But it's not where I would start. It's not where I would start to reform our education system. It's, it's, it's again a, a kind of a little bit of a cheap, a cheap shot from both, both major political parties, and it doesn't doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence that no matter who wins whatever election, I don't think we're going to get the systems change that we need for our children. And that worries me having two children and, and you've got two children. What, what's what's that going to say for their future? Because I'll be saying to my children when they're 16 years old, off you go to Holland, 17, 18, go get yourself a free education in a university in Europe. Because what's going to happen is our, our brightest and best children are going to get fed up with this and, and just off they go. But even their families might start to do that. We may lose and we keep losing some of our brightest and best, even some of our brightest and best teachers because... Yeah. They, and some of our, our, you know, our, my colleagues have, have decided to take themselves and their families to other countries and said, "This is not what I want for my children. I want a broad and balanced education for my children, and I'm not going to get it in this country." And off they go. So there is a real issue that they need to get a handle on. And and this tittling and tattling in the back about we're more aspirational than you, or we are with a party of aspiration. They're both fighting over who's got most ambition for children, but that's rhetoric. 
in actual reality, let's see them put the cash, the cash with it, where, where, where the rhetoric goes. And at the moment, I've not seen any plans whatsoever except this, this, this issue, yeah. which I think is a cheap, a cheap hit. Okay, so we did look for if there was any kind of like um, recent, you know. On, uh, information on this and there wasn't so we've gone back to Theresa May's yeah. uh, speech when she was in power um, she came in with a uh, with a meritocratic kind of standpoint didn't she she really wanted to kind of grow the meritocracy that was all her kind of pitch early on to be fair her speech she, she made in her opening opening um, address outside parliament I, I thought was that I thought was actually quite good and but then you'd heard it before and and, and I do think and, and I'm not Getting trying to get too political by getting too political, but you get where I'm going. I actually liked what Theresa May said when she came into power, and I had a little flicker of, oh, thank God, education, at least somebody finally gets it. Yeah. And I heard her speeches, and I thought, oh, good, good, good. This is what we needed after austerity. This is pre-COVID, of course, because, yeah. of course, the, you're talking 2016. We've had the, the dark years of 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, when funding went really bad, mm. 2, 12, 13, 14. So this was... This is what we needed to hear in 2016. So, have you got what she said? In yeah, so we'll, we'll play the we'll play this clip, and then we'll come back. To, we'll come to some messages, and then we'll kind of uh, carry on with what we're thinking. We need to ensure that there is good school place for every child, and education provision that caters to the individual needs and abilities of every pupil. Let's be honest about what these statistics mean. They mean that for far too many children in Britain, the chance they have in life is determined by where they live or how much money their parents have. Let's sweep away those barriers and encourage more people to join us in the task of delivering a good school place for every child. Let's build a truly dynamic school system where schools and institutions learn from one another, support one another and help one another. Let's offer a diverse range of good schools that ensure the individual talents and abilities of every child are catered for. That is my ambition. Through their charitable status, private schools collectively reduce their tax bills by millions every year. And I want to consult on how we can amend Charity Commission guidance for independent schools to enact a tougher test on the amount of public benefit required to maintain charitable status. It's important to state that this will be proportionate to the size and scale of the school in question. Not every school is an Eton or a Harrow. Many public schools are nowhere near that size. In a country that works for everyone, it doesn't matter where you were born or how much your parents earn. If you work hard and do the right thing, you will be able to go as far as you can. I want this country to be a great meritocracy. I want to see more houses built, better productivity, so we can have more well-paid jobs, more economic growth, not just in the southeast of England, but across the whole country to help more people get on. But more than anything else, I want to see children from ordinary working class families given the chances their richer contemporaries take for granted. That need, means we need more great schools. This is the plan to deliver them and to set Britain on the path to being the great meritocracy of the world. Thank you. Okay, I, I don't think there's anything there we disagree with, do you? I mean, it's, oh. it's, I mean it's, it shows you kind of how far the, the Tories have come, actually. Six, six years. Six, in, six, in six years. What happened? Uh, you know, what on earth happened to them to be so elitist now? I mean, uh, they are, they've are they gone almost completely against all of that, haven't they? they yeah, but that's why I, mean, I discovered that. Yeah. I had a look back and I thought, wow, w well, that's where we were six years ago. Where is that vision now? Where is that yeah. ambition now? And, and, and there was an honesty about that. There was a definite, we will, ha we will have a commission looking at, you know, and even, here's an interesting one, which I also find. This is Michael Gove, right? And, and believe you me, he's not my favourite person. He, he, he's, he's somebody, who I do admire his intelligence. He is an intelligent man. He's not somebody whose politics I would share. And his dancing ability is terrible. But <laughs> Michael Gove called for a scrapping of tax, break, tax breaks for private schools in a policy rejected by Rishi Sunak and supported ironically by Labour. The Conservative Cabinet Minister said in 2017 that removing the charitable status of private schools which saves parents paying VAT and fees would be one of the best ways to end society's burning injustices. Mr Gove, now levelling up secretary, said, to his continuing surprise, we consider the education of children of plutocrats and oligarchs to be a charitable activity. 
Mr Gove's comments contradicted the government, which pledged to keep the tax exemption in place. So, so there's obviously a conflict going on, internal conflict going on within the political parties, and, and a realisation of this just can't go on. And, and so in one way, I welcome Sir Keir Starmer raising the issue, and I think we need to have the discussion. But at the same time, is this where he starts his discussion on education? Or is it is he trying to balance off he's done one thing for one side and all this? And that, that's the real thing that really yeah. hurts me. Is I am sick of the games. Stop playing games with children's futures. My child's education is not a political football. The outcomes of my children should not be at the whims of a politician based upon a lack of evidence and based on their own political career. It is not fair. It is not fair in the country and it is not fair in the future of the country because education is vital to the health of the nation. And I think that which Theresa May said is exactly where political parties need to return to. That ambition, that meritocracy. And again, not my political party, not a person who, again, I would in many ways say I agree with their political stance. But that, I think we can all agree, was exactly what we need to happen in education. And yet it's lost in the ether, lost in the argument. And somehow now we're worse off than we were six years ago with things getting even wider. And unfortunately, we've no, I think, help coming. The cavalry is not coming, is what I'm saying. And I need the cavalry. I, I feel that my colleagues need the cavalry. The education system needs the cavalry. Where is the cavalry coming to relief us? We need the relief column and we need them now. Yeah. Because in the next couple of years, there's it's, 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 it's only I can only see the direction of travel with the cost of living crisis putting more of a squeeze on us. We are not a plump or fat enough a sector to absorb more of society's issues. We need help. Yeah. And I think we need the, the cavalry, whatever political cavalry wants to come to the aid of the education system i think it's i think it's sitting there and i don't know why i can't understand why they haven't made more of this like theresa may did i just i don't understand yeah their... I, mean, I mean although although we're, we're we're supporting theresa may they're just looking back at the graph that uh, lewis goodall um shared on twitter earlier on the week you know state funded schools did get uh, on average eight thousand pound we'll talk about that in a minute because i know you you mentioned on lbc the other night that um that that's not the case in all schools. No. Um, but eight thousand pound is the average, which seems quite high to me. I, don't know, I was quite surprised by that eight thousand pound. Um, during her tenureship, it dropped um, maybe up, and t- up to around seven thousand pound as the, the private school um, average increased during that time. So, although again, it's the talk, isn't it? The, the talk was there, but actually, the reality um, was what, what wasn't there. And in that time, which we we do know. That you know, reading ages are um, are down. You know, I, I always find this incredible about reading ages that uh, the average is not is is nine years old, um, but that leaves fourteen percent of adults unable to read labels on food. Um, so again, not only does that uh, sixth wealthiest country in the world, yeah, but that then leads into other problems in this public sector, doesn't it? About health outcomes and the NHS crisis. So and these that are the type. people more likely to use the NHS, these are the people more likely to cost us money, these are the people less likely to be able to get jobs. And this is the yeah, robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's right, yeah. so it has that knock-on effect, doesn't it? Well, it's, 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 it always reminds me of the, the national efficiency argument when they started doing the liberal reforms at the turn of the 20th century. And, and that they did liberal reforms because society just could not, they figured out that, you know, they weren't able to fight a war should it happen. So mm. it was like, oh gosh, we have to look after people because the outcomes, if we don't, we won't be able to build factories. And this is the health of the nation. If we don't have people who are literate, how do you expect them to read a food label and eat healthy food? Yeah. How, you know, how do we, exp- I mean, we had a really good, it was a really good discussion last night on about political literacy. Well, let's start with literacy and then we'll get to political yeah, literacy. Yeah, there's like a, it's like a step. Well, Except before, you know what I mean? Why don't we have 40% of people vote? Well, because they often try and say, who do we vote for? And this is the thing, it can't be on, everything can't be on schools. Because mm. I have children who are parents, are magnificent parents, but they're working three and four jobs. They're out there working three or four jobs. And what they're not doing is they're not with their children, educating their children. This is one of the things I saw during COVID. Is some children did okay during COVID because they actually saw their parents for a change. They actually had the time to spend with their parents because their parents weren't working all hours of the day to keep food on the table. And all these things are connected. The, the nursery fees. It's absolutely criminal that what's charged for nursery fees in this country, which doesn't allow for people to, to again, I think, spend the quality time. I think everything about the family, education system, the way we're living our lives, it's all connected. It's helter-skelter. It's rat race. 
It's absolute rat race. And this has come from a kid who grew up in a working class background. But I had a mum at home and I come home and she read to me. So I got, in a weird way, I didn't have the opportunities that say somebody had at a private school. But I tell you what I did have. I went in a class. What was my class size at at primary school? 13. Mm. There was 13 in my class at primary school. But that, that would be what now? 30, 31, 32, 33? Yeah. And I only yeah. realise that now. I think, wow, I got such a really good deal in yeah. my little country primary school. Yeah. You, know what's, you know what's happened to it recently? After 186 years, they closed it. Because it wasn't economically viable. Yeah. And there you have it. Yeah, that's the reason. There you have it. And, yeah. and, and, and a lot of my friends, we all, every one of us failed the 11th class in my class. Yeah. And, and all of all those... All of us have done well yeah. because we went to the secondary school. We had the cultural capital of going to a good little primary school. And we all got there. Some went into vocation, some went into uh, technical colleges. But every single one of those guys have got ended up in degrees, ended up very productive yeah. because they got a good start in life because they went to a good little school. And that good little school taught them well mm. because they had the time, they had a good curriculum, and they had supportive parents. And it wasn't that the parents were wealthy. There were farmers' sons in there. There were farmers' daughters in there. My, my dad's a plasterer. Mum's a housewife. But this is the problem. We're dealing with society now. It's just too fast, too quick. And people are struggling to keep up. And, and what's happening, I really don't begrudge anybody wanting the best for their child and saying, we're going to send that child to that school. But it's almost now as if it's the school has to be the rescuing factor. It's on us. We've got to override all of the society's issues. And I don't think we can. And I don't think we are equipped to. But you're trying to make us do that while also cutting our funding. Oh, come on, yeah. help us. And just to mirror what you said earlier, we've had a, a message come in uh, to us on the show. So thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Um, recently taken my career to Belgium um, and my future children will go through the EU um, school system. Um, so maybe I know that um, Teacher Talk Radio has lots of international teachers listening. So it'd be great. Great to hear your perspective on that. Have you moved abroad? Have you moved your ch- children out of uh, the uh, British state education system? And what were your reasons for that? And what differences um, are you seeing? Um, one of the, the extra things that uh, Lewis Goodhall shared after um, that graph was about the from the seven percent of the UK population that attended um, independent school, sixty five percent of them are our senior judges. <laughs> Um, that's incredible because they're the ones that then you know have that authority and that's what people working class people see when they go to courts it's, it's people from a certain group um, civil servants and permanent secretaries 59% members of the House of Lords 57% diplomats 52% junior ministers uh, 52% and then the kind of the swing happens armed forces officers 49% oh, yeah. that's Sandhurst isn't it that's, that's yeah. almost um that's almost a, a stereotype in itself, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Look at newspaper columnists. Forty-four percent of newspaper columnists yeah. and news media. Forty-three percent of new me- yeah. news media. What did I say was the seven percent? Yeah. So seven percent of the population is what goes to the, the private school, and yet sixty odd percent of the judges. Yeah, I mean, I mean, <laughs> evidence does suggest that that is it is changing. However, it is um, um, it is very slow. And that was the report by uh, the Sutton Trust in 2019 called Elitist Britain. I'll share that on our Twitter feed as people can read it. Uh, but 39% of Britain's most powerful people are five more lightly uh, than the general public to have gone to private school. Uh, 52% um, over half of senior judges went through private school or the Oxbridge uh, pipeline. And... Um, you know, and, and, but they, they do say in their report that change is happening, but it's just incredibly slow. So it's whether we take a slow change over no change, or is, is, I mean, is, I is, is the overall trajectory yeah. kind of going in that? Yes, there is change. I mean, I've sent children at Oxbridge from, from my little, you know, deindustrialized part of Derbyshire, and, and I've seen children challenge, you know, the system. But one of the interesting things is I've noticed that the children I've sent down from who are working class, all of a sudden, um, last time I spoke to one particular school down a couple of years ago, his accent has changed slightly. His appearance has changed slightly. And I asked him the honest question. Mm. I sat down with him and had a pint with him. Um, I said, look, have you had to adapt and change a lot about yourself to fit in with your new friends? And his honest answer was, yeah. 
I come home and it reminds me of that movie The Departed you know The Departed with the Leonardo DiCaprio he is and there's a scene in it when he says you know, he has to pretend to be a police officer and also still a working class kid from South Shield South and Southie in Boston and he has this ability of like being able to be two different people to two different groups and that's what this 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 ex pupil of mine said that in order for him to fit in he does then have to sort of change slightly how he speaks he has to change a little bit about himself in order to be able to turn around and, and, and then just sort of like how do we how do we sort of adapt to that so it, it's interesting that you can change the system from within the system but are there the critical numbers or is there enough children making it through the system and that was that was a comment that was made again by the social mobilities are he says we shouldn't focus on the the small number of of success stories that have made it through the system and are somehow you know and i've got case study after case study of the handful of children or i could say who have overridden you know, some children who are you know working in those professions you've talked about and they are sometimes what keeps me in the game because at least I can say to myself, oh, thankfully, this some have made it through the system. There is some now within the higher echelons and moving up in society into higher levels. But here's the problem, and this is what breaks my heart. When I see some of these individuals who've made it through, who, as you, we mentioned earlier on, who've gone through that system, do they then lower the ladder? Do they then enable the next generation of them? Mm. Or do they pull the ladder up? Yeah. And unfortunately, I can only see one direction at the moment, and that is not the ladder being lowered. It is not the idea. And it's the same with jobs. Don't like the job you're in, go leave it. There seems to be an almost cynicism and a selfishness and a I don't care what happens society. It's about me. And again, when, and you see this creeping in. Is this what's being done to us? Is that we are it's not about the collective good of society, the collective good of all the children, uh, the community. It's my child. I'm going to do what's best for my child. I don't care about anything else. It's me versus the world. And, and I get that my parents were like that. They wanted best for me too. But you can't. we can't just have a whole society of people operating like that because they won't be able to function. And unfortunately, the political class at the moment seem to be pushing people into that. And you saw that with like Marcus Rashford. Oh God, Marcus Rashford. I'm a Liverpool supporter. Marcus Rashford. God, absolute legend. I have to shake his hand and say, even though I'm, I'm dying in the wall, Liverpool supporter. Sorry if I lost some, lost some of our listeners. But absolutely amazing during the COVID crisis. He, could, he didn't have to do anything there. But he felt, I'm going to help others. Intrinsically help, altruistically help others. Mm because it's the right thing to do. Oh, right. yeah. I was a poor kid. Yeah. I wanted to help others because I know what it feels like to be hungry. Now, the people in Parliament who voted against him, where have they, where have they been hungry? Had they been in that education system? And some had, but that didn't stop them saying, oh, well, you know what, we sacrificed. And the excuses, oh, when I was young, we had frost in the windows. And you think there's almost this beat people down attitude of like, it's your own fault. Your child's not doing well. It's your own fault. It's your own fault. And yes, there are opportunities, but that comes down to life chances. And unfortunately, we don't have a level playing field. If you had a level playing field and people don't take their opportunities, you could say, that's absolutely fine. But let's not kid ourselves. The playing field isn't level. And we are condemning some children to a life of lesser, second class, because this is quite simply are written off by an establishment who basically don't value them. They don't value them. Well, it was their paradigm as well, because uh, Lewis goes on to say that um, if you put the actual cabinets into that graph, it's 65% of the cabinets are from uh, private school. And obviously every single prime minister. Oh, 19 had. from Eton. 19 prime ministers. Yeah. I often use that in Apple, an example. When I'm saying to the children, you know, David Campbell and, 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 and uh, Boris Johnson were in the same cohort, not the same class or same year, yeah. but they were at school, the same school at the same time, two yeah. prime ministers a couple of years apart. Yeah, it's incredible. It is absolutely <laughs> incredible. And again, I, I can't blame Mr. Cameron's father or, or Mr. Johnson's father for, for doing what they feel is right for their children. But it's that, it's, I hate that phrase and I hate saying that phrase. It's not what you know. It's, it's who you know, and it shouldn't be when they're talking about meritocracy and they're talking about talent. Imagine we ran, I ran my classroom like that. I don't run my classroom like that. I run my classroom to be a meritocracy where children work hard and they strive, and the harder they work, the best, the better the exam results they should get. 
And that's the way it should be. It should be down to the individual getting the talents of those individual people and nurturing them and growing them through an education system which gets the best out of them. At the moment, it's not working because it's not it's not it's not fair that some children just get a better deal by accident of birth. It's just not it's just it's just not fair. No. It's not fair whatsoever, yeah. and it's, it's not fair on some some teachers who are trying their best and who seek out some schools. And I know colleagues of mine who who don't go for the leafy suburb school. They go into the urban inner city school that they come out of themselves, and they work so hard, and they have nothing but my deep admiration and respect. I'm talking about the you know, dangerous, dangerous lives of, uh, what's that song? Coolio, you know. Oh, Gangsta's Pirate. Gangsta's, Gangsta's Pirate, you know what I mean? God bless those teachers that go into those schools and try their best in the real toughest, toughest, toughest places to socially mobile some ch- And they are the unsung heroes of the education system yeah. because they, they try their best to get those children out of those situations. And I don't think... I don't think again that's encouraged. I don't think that's helped. No, so we've, we've all been in this uh, position. Well, I, I, I've, I've been through this with my my oldest now in secondary school. So that kind of that kind of debate has kind of been had, and we've kind of moved on for it because my younger child will next year go to the same school. If a parent came up to you and said, "I want to send my child to a inverted commas good school," what are you telling them? What would you tell them? I mean. What, what are they looking for? I mean, I mean, I mean there's Ofsted, there's, there's a measure. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we look at that, don't we, and say, well, this is an excellent school, this is a good school, and the, the inspectors have come round and said, uh, this is um, not so good school. Interestingly, the school that was excellent when we were, um, when we were looking for school has now been completely downgraded um, because they hadn't been off studied for 15 years, which is quite incredible. Interesting. And, and then once they'd been off studied, they've, they've come back with a whole host of problems, largely safeguarding issues around um, attitudes, around um, homophobia, racism, um, that um, and bullying and that type of thing. However, um, their exam results were good. Their, their exam results were, were, were superb. Yeah. Um, so, Interestingly, kind of in our local community, people are saying, well, hang on a minute. Their data was good. The data's good. Mm-hmm. And if my son and daughter goes here, um, they will still get good outcomes. So do I ride that out? Is it more important? I, I guess it's kind of what is more important mm-hmm. from school. Is, is, it, is, it the, is it the high results? Because, and I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I went to that school and for the first five years of my daughter's life I was kind of talking to my wife about how do we get our children into said catchment area um, to facilitate that um, you know so the house prices within that catchment area reflect of course yeah of course yeah, yeah of, of course it goes back but, but, to ambition now you're an ambitious yeah, parent yes but is that, is that the aspiration that he's talking about that yeah, well that's what that's what that's a certain group of people think aspiration yeah. is so so that that's the equation that people are trying to build in their heads all the time, aren't they? You don't want to send you. You don't. You don't want to deliberately say. But do you know the toxicity of that? Yeah. The toxicity of that is when I have a parent come to me and say, "What level is my child working at?" Yeah. <laughs> you want to know what level your child is working at? Do you want to know your child is one of the most amazing young people I've ever met? Yeah. Do you want to know your child is a kind, compassionate human being? Do you want to know your child stood up to bullying recently? Yeah. Do you want me to answer that question, or do you want me to tell you a crude number that your child is equating yeah. to some data spreadsheet? Yeah. And that's what exactly what you're fighting against. An education system that's boiled down the worth of people to a simple figure. And mm. again, I point to exactly what happened during the COVID crisis. And I think that was the canary in the coal mine. That, for me, was the perfect encapsulation, that rogue algorithm, which, let's say it, and let's say exactly how, what I feel about it, discriminated against mm. some children based upon their parents, their postcode, and the predicted outcomes if I was an algorithm, I wouldn't be sitting here right now with you. I wouldn't have had the confidence or or, or the, the determination to even host a radio station. This is the thing, son of a father, his father, pastor, mum, a housewife. I wouldn't be here if I was now going through the education system. And that's what worries me is that I had the opportunity at a time when I got to university for free. But my parents were aspirational, but I had the opportunities. And it's a weird thing to say. I had opportunities now that the equivalent of me is not getting. That's the problem. That is why the doors are being closed, the ladder is being pulled up, and education should be the way that we 
level up the country, ironically, and it is a way that the country is being divided even more. In a time of division, it is another example of the divisions in society where it should be one of those ways that we actually give people a fair Unfortunately, some of the people in charge are ones that saying, I got the opportunity, I got the opportunity. You're thinking, yeah, you did. But why aren't you helping others like you? Mm. Why aren't you championing? Why are you closing the door? Why are you so harsh and horrible to people trying to do what you did? And I can't, for the life of me, understand that psychology. No. I don't get it. It's because it's alien to me. Because my first instinct is, is to see somebody in trouble, is to help them. Just but help them up. But, the, but that's the empathy, isn't it? Well, it's the compassion. It's the empathy. So, so, so are we saying that empathy is not taught? Because James O'Brien's done some... He has. Done, done a and he's of, public school himself, public isn't he? School, but he's, he's, he's taught before, hasn't he, about the lack of empathy that he came out of the private education system with. And he's very honest about he's it, very, actually. very honest, and he had therapy, didn't he, to... Yeah. Um, I think I can't remember the title. Is it know how to be wrong or know yeah. how to be right or yeah. something sort of like know how to be wrong. Um, a sense you, with him a journey going through. Yeah, a, a bit a big journey. I think there's a trot, a trot, and again, some some students have traumas going through private private schools. Yeah. Some have had to leave private schools yeah. because of the pressure and the stress. They're yeah. not, and they will also have that through the state school as well. But yeah, then, the, the people but then, my yeah. younger brother had a horrible experience at a grammar school yeah. because he was put under pressure at the age of eleven. And I often think the irony was is that we were wrong because I should have went there at 11 and he should have went where I went at 11. Yeah. And that's the problem is that we need square pegs in, in square holes. We need round pegs in round holes. And again, this is our problem when it comes to skills and vocations. We are forcing children against their nature to go to schools that they probably don't need to go to or don't want to go to. And then because the parents have a vision of them and it comes down to like option choices. I have this at GCSE. You know, parents that don't want their children to do music or art or culture, seeing this with degrees. Mm. My own parents, when I got my A levels, were like, well, "What are you doing a geography degree for? Why don't you go into law?" Because they were ambitious for me, and I was like, "No, I want to do that." And this is the problem: is is that I think sometimes parents, without realizing it, mm. don't realize the mistake. I, I, we're parents ourselves; we're not perfect human beings. We yeah. try our best yeah. to do what we think is right. And I have nothing but sympathy sometimes for a lot of parents out there who are scrimping and saving to get their children into what we term as a good school. I don't have an issue with that because who's going to have an issue with a parent trying to do the best thing for their children? Yeah, That's the most absolutely. natural course, thing. Yeah. But the problem is I don't think they have the right information. I don't think society is creating a situation where that child may be better, not in a private school. And yeah. equally, there are children who might be better in a private school not there I don't think we have the right people in the right place sometimes for the right reasons and unfortunately that's not getting the best out of our children if you had the money no <laughs> don't even I, don't, I, I, won't, I won't do it you see, you see, I, you see I, no I I I won't do, I wouldn't I, be I, would, I, I wouldn't I'm going to say it I wouldn't do what a certain Labour politician did I, I wouldn't do it and you know what but would, but would you even think is it because you have to almost put that onto you, I have to put that kind of hypothetical onto you, whereas if you just had the money, it would just be the most natural thing to do. I can understand yeah. why people do, yeah. I, I, but for me, I'm the primary educator. Yeah. My parents were my primary, my yeah. mother was my primary educator. Yeah, yeah. And I think after the primary school my child gets, a really good, and I went to, yeah. she's gone to the local yeah. primary school. Well, we, we don't know the date, we don't know the amount no. of people who have um, been privately educated and then not sent the children to. So we don't necessarily know if it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an obvious choice. If you are privately educated, do you therefore my, my privately educate? My wife's the same, she's a double doctorate. Yeah. She went to local comprehensive. Her father's a university professor, her mother's a primary school teacher. So it's no accident I married into a family who have, you know, meritocracy and education in their veins. Yeah. Because I understand the power of it. My, my children, your children will be absolutely fine, yeah. regardless, I think, of the school they go to. Because the attitude of you and I will be enough to yeah. override whatever experience they get at school. Yeah. Because if they don't have the facilities at school, I'll take my daughter dancing. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take her to certain things. And already our lives are filled with taxi runs all around. Oh, <laughs> Come yeah. on, you know, I, I, we, yeah. we, 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 we have enough about, this is the thing. And this is, this is, the th I don't fe feel the need that I need to send my child to a private school mm. because we're able to already, my wife and I give her what she it, would yeah. need from a private school yeah, yeah. and the confidence in it because we're educated enough to be able to educate our own children. And, and that's not arrogant. That's just the honest appraisal of it. Yeah. They, my children have enough cultural capital from their parents as regards 
sending them to a private school. That's my feeling on yeah. it. I just want to read this because I thought this was really interesting from the key points from this elitist report from the Sutton Trust. And I think this kind of uh, is interesting for both sides of the argument, whether uh, state or private schools are working for what businesses need, is that 43% of FTSE 100 CEOs, 41% of the 350 FTSE CEOs, um, 51% of the Sunday Times Rich List um, have um, have been scored abroad. That's interesting. So it's not as if the, the private sector is doing that well for business either in terms of what they're feeding in because they're coming from abroad anyway. But you know but one of the things always about the British Empire, if you often, I always love Wikipedia entries and looking up some of our leading lights, like Spike Milligan, you know, born in India, or it's always quite interesting when you see some of our best actors and stuff. They were forces kids, yeah. or they were parents were abroad, yeah. or they lived in other countries. It's interesting when you see, mm-hmm. and because I, I again I, I'd say it because they have that risk taking, that confidence, the cultural capital. It's that life experience passed on to them. Yeah. But I do think there is a lot to be said for the, not just the genetics; it's the passing down of the values and the confidence, and that who you surround yourself with and I think that's also the choices my daughter's got a lovely set of friends she'll be absolutely fine those parents are similar people to ourselves you choose don't you you choose the people around you don't you and I I get why some people would say I want to send my child to a a school where people share their values they share their ambitions and And of course I have an irony in this is that I'm at a faith based school and one of the things about that is, is that I have children whose parents actually go out of the way to send their children to so I get a little bit I get a little bit yeah, of what a private school yeah. gets. It's kind of selection, but mm. it's not selection. And, and economically speaking, we are as, as broad a range of economic backgrounds that you can get. But there is one deciding factor. The majority of the parents, the parents even I will see the majority of the parents because they've chosen, here's the value, they've chosen to send. So I appreciate why people do send their children to be educated to those schools. Because I understand the psychology behind that, because that's also psychology of which I've been part of as well. Okay. Well, my daughter's just like the show. <laughs> so, she was, you know, we're, we're talking about her. She's obviously just tuned in, um, probably to see um, when their daddy's going to take them swimming. I think okay. that's the thing. Well, so, well, I think that nicely kind of wraps up today's show. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, and thank a couple you. of things we need to point out, though. Um, yeah, yeah. We've yeah. got a couple of things coming up this week in um, Teachers Talk Radio. There was a cl- cracking um, conversation this morning with Tom Rogers in part of a, a, a little um, future of education. The second part of that's tomorrow night. We had um, Reams Political Literacy last night. Um, that will be able to download. We've got the, Dr. Poppy Gibson's first show with us. Uh, that was on Friday. That's worth a, a listen back to. The fake head teacher always does his briefing on Monday Monday mornings, which is absolutely hilarious. We've got Ben Thomas's first show coming up on Tuesday the 11 a.m. Uh, Lucy is still doing her um, 50 grand, the, the, the 50 grand show. She's co-hosting, and and it's a 50 grand show where if you had a 50 grand, what would you do with it in your school? Glue sticks is mine. Um, and Mark Creasy's looking at mental health on Wednesday, which I think links nicely into this. So um, next week we'll be discussing faith-based education in light of the recent census. Is there a place for faith-based schools in a country that's becoming less faith-based? Um, and then also we're looking for new presenters. Uh, come and join the Teachers Talk radio team. The essence will be cl- assimilated into the collective um, and we will have a fresh transfusion of uh, the hive mind which is basically we've had lots of new presenters. That's my way of saying we've had lots of new presenters. But we've also been sponsored by a two, I have to mention our two sponsors, which are absolutely fantastic. We've had John Cat Educational, one of our new sponsors, and they're a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides, and magazines, which is specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond, to infinity and beyond. So have you checked out their latest releases, releases and please don't miss out on that. Uh, you can visit them at John Cat. That's C A T T bookshop.com and explore the fun range of titles. Some really good ones coming up there for Christmas, for maybe a Christmas present, for leisure, pleasure, or for CPD. So check out John Cat Books Bookshop. And we also are our other sponsor, Weather Slack Group, who's a leading provider of specialist education and care. They need more people like you, and, and you'll be given some resources and offered a clear path and some career progression and reward it with some of the best salaries and benefits the industry has to offer. Education and industry, fantastic. Weather Slack currently has some fantastic career opportunities, and you can check them out at www. Slack 
www.co.uk forward slash careers. Sound like one of those guys selling insurance. Yeah, there, doing I? really well. Doing really well there. Does it work with my? Uh, <laughs> does, <laughs> it, does, it, does it work with? Does it, does it work with my accent? Well, really? it's, 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 it's certainly a thing, isn't it? I, I can I can see that. Working. I thought I was going to do my Terry, my best Terry Wogan, or, or, or what do you call it, uh, or Graham Norton kind of, you know, Irish kind of. Or, or I'll do my best. What's him on, on BBC Five Live? And yeah, I, five Live. Yeah. I, what's uh, he's on BBC Five Live, isn't he? Uh, or uh, Colin Murray. Yeah. I, I, welcome to Teachers Talk Radio with Colin. Yeah. I, I, I should get myself into trouble. Yeah. I'm going off script now. That's all right. We're going to we're, we're going to leave you then today. Then and have our celebratory um, alp of Toblerone, which we've had at the end of each show. Uh, thanks very much for listening and tuning in. If you want to be involved next week. Um, I'll be in the pub from six o'clock. You'd be planning in the pub at six o'clock, yeah. You I'll, I'll, I'll nip out. I uh, got distracted this week because the Christmas tree going up, so I'll be having a pint, making notes. Um, I'll see if the last notes on the on my Twitter feed comes true, and that's in my um, um, bonus paycheck. This uh, uh, for Christmas would be nice. Hint, hint. Hint. Talk radio. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Uh, the the graphic. That's you, by the way. Um, long live the revolution. That's all I was like. Uh, but thank you for listening, yeah. and thank you for for tuning in. And if you want to catch us back on on um, the Twitter Spaces or on Podbeam, then please download. But also check out some of our other um, fantastic um, Podbeam episodes as well. Some of our previous ones as well. Thank you, and enjoy your football tonight at seven o'clock. I am not going to tell you which country I am opting to support. Come on, England! You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.